In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed the art thou among them, and blessed the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O oh God, it instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Father Lanteri. Pray for us. Saint Ignatius. Pray for us. Saint John Henry Newman. Pray for us. Oh God's angels and saints. Pray for us. Good afternoon. Today's a very special day uh, for me anyway, hopefully for you, uh, for many reasons. Uh, for the topic we're going to be addressing, it's a very important topic as they all are, but today's a very special topic. Also because um, uh, because uh, the 13th of October, which is today, is the feast day of St. Edward the Confessor, so it's my onomastico, my my feast day today. Okay. No one knows it except me, but I'll tell you now. <laughs> also, it's the 13th of October, which is Our Lady of Fatima, feast day of Our Lady of Fatima, the great miracle of the sun, the great miracle of the sun. And uh, also, it's because, um, because uh, the Holy Father canonized a new saint today and his name is Cardinal Newman, okay? Uh, it's not to be confused with uh, St. John Neumann, who was the Bishop of Philadelphia back about 150 years ago. Uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman, maybe very few of you know who he is, but a great saint and uh, possibly the greatest theologian in the Catholic Church after Thomas Aquinas. So. That's huge, okay? And uh, also, I love the story of conversions. The greatest conversion in the world, of course, is, is uh, St. Paul. Then outside of the Bible would be, of course, St. Augustine. Here in the United States, I would say probably Scott Hahn is, the, is, is, the, is probably the most influential conversion in the United States, but obviously the most important conversion in England would be would be Cardinal Newman in the uh, in the 19th century. He lived 1801 to 1890, almost 90 years old, which is pretty long back then. And if you like the English language, or you want to really get to know the language English language. Probably the greatest writer in prose in England would be Cardinal Newman. And you can read his tractates, which would be his homilies. You can read his idea of the university, which is a spiritual masterpiece, which he wrote when he was the, he was the uh, headmaster in Dublin, Ireland, at the oratory which he established. He became an oratorian priest of St. Philip Neri. And also his masterpiece would be Apologia Pro Vita, which was written in defense of him being vilified and slandered in um, England after his conversion. No? Uh, and I would say maybe, maybe start to pray to him because today, more than ever, education is in crisis. Okay? And he was a champion of two things, champion of conscience, well-formed conscience, and a champion of education, as well as a harbinger or precursor to the Vatican II teaching. Okay? He, his uh, preaching was uh, 
uh, a preparation for Vatican II, which was in the 1960s. So uh, I'm rejoicing because we got a new canonized saint, and given that um, uh, I think he's so he's so important for what's going on in the world today, I think that uh, you might even just Google in to get to know him a little bit, okay? Cardinal Newman. <coughs> Cardinal John Henry Newman. When he was an Anglican priest, his, his uh, homily on Sunday would be an hour long, and he would just be reading his homily, you know? He'd pack the church anyway, because of the, the depth. He was a real intellectual. Okay? So don't be afraid of the intellectuals, okay? No, they're, they're good, okay? <laughs> and he was obviously anointed his, his writings, you no? Know? The prayer that Mother Teresa prays at the end of the Mass is written by Cardinal Newman also. And his uh, great poem, Lead Gently Into the Light, he, he wrote that when he was in Sicily, about to come back to England when he'd visited Italy. Lead Gently Into the Light, one of the most beautiful poems and prayers in the history of Catholicism. Okay? Google it in, Cardinal Newman, Lead Gently Into the Light. Okay. Okay, so that's my Newman pitch today. Years ago, um, any of you who have uh, children and they had to go through, through the teen years, they're often stormy years, no? The teen years. Uh, my parents uh, had a boy, 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 and then finally a girl, and her name is Victoria. Okay, so that's her name, okay? When my sister Victoria was in her teen years, she was going through a lot of, um, some questioning, and she didn't want to go to confession. And my mom insisted that she go to confession because we gotta to go to confession. So after several years, my sister said, I will go to confession, but under one condition, is I don't want to go face to face to the priest. Because he was, one of, he was a friend of the family there in, in Massachusetts. So one day arrived, and then my sister said, Mom, I will go to confession, but under one condition, I want to go behind the screen. So my mom said, no problem. So my sister, my sister hid behind the screen like this. And she said, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. My last confession was nine months ago. And Father Goff went like this. Oh, hi, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> so that broke the ice. And from that moment on, she never had any problems with the confession again. So the devil works. The devil works hard to prevent many graces. So the topic today we're going to be talking about is God's mercy and how to make a general confession. That's going to be the topic today. God's mercy and how to make a general confession. When I say general, that does not mean generic, abstruse, or abstract, but general means a confession of your whole life. In other words, you're going to be going into the inner recesses of your attic. You're going to be sweeping it out with Father Broom, okay? <laughs> Clean sweep with Father Broom, huh? Mm -hmm. it's a good name, huh? Confessing all. Now, some of you might be questioning, why do I have to do this? I've already made my confession. Well, in response to that, I'll defend why we should do it. First, as St. Ignatius says, we should make our gender confession, and I think that's enough for me. St. Ignatius, he's a saint. We're not yet. Okay? So, given Ignatius says we should do the gender confession, 
people. Let's follow in the footsteps of the saints. <coughs> Second, a genuine confession helps you to grow in humility. As well as in self-knowledge. And also, another reason might be this. There are certain sins that we commit that are very embarrassing. They cause a lot of shame. And if we have not confessed that sin, a mortal sin, then we're making bad confessions. Okay? And if, even if it's just one sin you committed maybe, maybe 30 years ago. Who knows, maybe it was a homosexual act or masturbation or looking at pornography or premarital sex or, you know, these, they're, it's kind of embarrassing those sins. You know? It causes a lot of shame. And sometimes the devil will paralyze us through fears and we, you know, we can't get it out. And if we do that, then we're making a bad confession. And if you make a bad confession, then you're also making bad communions. And I'm not here to throw a guilt trip, but rather to try to help us to come to terms with the truth. Very easy for us to hide sins because of fear and shame. Let me take one more step. Church has gone through a tough time. You know, the priesthood and the episcopacy. Uh, but I'd have to say what's even more serious than the priesthood is marriage. I mean, the priest has got some problems, but the marriage state is much worse than the priesthood. No offense, no. <laughs> tell you, well, most priests are pretty happy. They're hardworking. You know? well, they do a pretty good job. But as a whole, the, mar the marital state is is in shambles. Now, who, who on earth does not have a dysfunctional family today? Maybe, maybe one in a thousand. No? You know, I'm not, I'm not cynical or skeptical, but rather I'm, I'm a realist. No? I studied Thomas Aquinas many years. I'm a realist. No? Why? I think you're, prob you're probably going to blame the society, but I think that's a cop-out. I think it's a cop-out. I honestly believe one of the reasons why is that uh, most couples do not have an adequate preparation before they get married. Amen? Amen. They do not have an adequate uh, formation. Your son's on, on the highway to the priesthood. It's a long haul. Undergrad, four years. Another six years. It's basically ten years, right? Double doctorate, really. Double PhD. If you put the years together, no? So if you arrive at the priesthood, you get a long haul. So if it takes us from six to ten years to be a priest, do you think six months is too much for a married couple to get prepared? That's ludicrous, huh? That's as they say in Argentinian Sp Spanish, una broma de mal gusto. <laughs> una broma de mal gusto. Sour joke, huh? Uh, couples, uh, the, they're not prepared enough. So of all the programs in L.A., what is the parish that has the most demanding programs? What? Who's the culprit? Oh, the the <laughs> yep. I'm the culprit. Any program you come into, you, you got to step over my dead body, huh? And I'm not dead yet. Okay. Confirmation program, 
or the marriage program or the exercises program is the most demanding of all the programs in LA. Why? Because I love our people and I want the best for you. Say thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. <laughs> I raise the bar. I raise the bar. Want me to lower it? No. Eric, should I lower it? No. Mary? Should I lower it? No. Keep jumping. Become a kangaroo. Keep jumping. <laughs> Get a pogo stick. Okay. You know what a pogo stick is? Yes. I used to do pogo sticking uh, without any hands up, up and down the stairs when I was a teenager. Yeah. 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 Should have won the Guinness record, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty athletic, yeah. So, um, getting back to our topic, talking about the marriage crisis, uh, let me... Let me formulate a scenario which is really not fiction, but is a splice of life, which means it's, it's real. Okay, say that uh, Lope and Juanito, they're about to get married. They've been going out for maybe three years. And uh, it's uh, a week before their wedding. So a week before their what, what are they thinking about? They're thinking about the hypostatic union that the Father Broom taught in the theology class. Nah. <laughs> Fat chance, huh? I doubt it. No? They're thinking about their guests. Right? They're thinking, uh, the woman is thinking about her wedding dress. Is it going to be white or beige? How long is the veil going to be? What type of shoes? What, what, what hair salon is she going to go to? All these super important questions, right? Transcendental, huh? Then the cake. Is it going to be devil food cake or angel cake? Oh. <laughs> A culinary two standards, huh? <laughs> no, maybe carrot cake. Maybe I'll take your glasses off, okay? Yeah. Will you throw rice? Or the modern fad of the young people because they want to follow Franciscan poverty bubble stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Franciscan poverty, right? <laughs> After wasting half a million bucks on the other stuff, huh? <laughs> so they're thinking about all these, these super important elements. Excuse my English sarcasm. No? But they haven't been to confession. Haven't been to confession in about a year. They've been fornicating, yeah couple of times a month, about 25 times since their last. Haven't gone to Mass uh, once a month. And both of them have got high as a kite you know, on a couple of drugs, huh? They've been listening to Elton John Rocket Man, <laughs> flying high as a kite. <laughs> what goes up must come down, though, right? So there they, ha there they have both of them probably at least a hundred mortal sins, if not more. Then the day of their wedding, they get married, but they never went to confession before they were married. In the marriage, there is a mass. Rather in the, yeah, in the marriage, there's, a, there's a mass within the, you get a, a nuptial mass, okay? What happens on the day of the wedding? You have a double sacrilege in the other wedding. Hello? It's a double sacrilege. A double sacrilege on the day that they get married. So the day that they have all these social 
uh, encouterments that are decorating their whole social milieu. <laughs> yeah, they are crucifying Jesus two times. That's happening right and left. So they have their first kid, second kid. Ever since they were married, they never get along. They're always fighting like cats and dogs. They're always quarreling and bickering. They're angry. They're not at peace. And after eight years, after the third kid, a big argument and it's blown apart. And Lupe goes back to live with her mother. They never receive the grace of marriage. They never received the grace of marriage. Because they never went to confession to restore themselves to sanctifying grace. How many couples, how many couples does that does that happen to? Pro probably most. It's between you and your conscience, no? Probably most. That's why you got 60% of the marriages today that end up in divorce. And that I really believe to be one of the principal causes. I think a book should be written on that. I should get out my pen, huh? <laughs> or get out my computer keys, no? And give me a three-week sabbatical and it's going to be published. <laughs> The only person I've only person I've ever heard preach on this is yours truly. I've never heard anyone ever make any allusion to this. For me, it's it's so clear. For that reason, anyone who comes to get married in this church. I'm not, I'm not going to marry them unless they make their gender confession. Did a couple of marriages yesterday. I connect them with spiritual mentors, and they prepare these people to make the best confession in their life. Choose whatever priest you want. Write down those sins. Get it all out. Then I'll marry you. Otherwise, I'm not going to marry you. Go somewhere else. I'm not going to give you the noose by which you hang yourself. I'm not going to do that. Some of you have teenagers, when they make their confirmation, make sure they go to confession 24 hours before they're confirmed. You got some parents that have teenagers here. In other words, we have to take the sacrament seriously. We have to take our sacramental life seriously. Scott Hahn says the sacraments are like fire. And the image I give is this. When I was about 11 in New York, uh, me and my older brother decided we were, we were Boy Scouts heading to be, I guess Cub Scouts, heading to be Boy Scouts. We decided we were going to sleep out you know, at the end of November. This is not California, this is New York. It gets really cold in New York. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we lit a fire. And uh, uh, my brother had a sleeping bag, but I didn't have a sleeping bag. So I, I asked uh, Billy Tabbert, who was one of, my one of our best friends, if he could lend me his sleeping bag. So about two, it really got cold. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I, I smelled the fire. I was creeping closer to the fire with, with his sleeping bag caught on fire. So <laughs> the sleeping bag caught on fire. That was the fire. And I had to put it out. So it got even colder, and I smelled another fire. Once again, it was burning. I was creeping closer. It got so cold. By the end of the night, there were about four fires. It was all the sleeping bag. <laughs> when I returned the sleeping bag to, to Billy Tabbert, we were no longer friends, OK? <laughs> 
name is Billy Tabard, if you want to maybe Google that in. He <laughs> probably opened up a store selling sleeping bags, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but my point is this, if I were too close to it, that would actually burn the sleeping bag. But if it maintained a safe distance, it would keep me warm. So it is with the sacraments. Either the sacraments are sources of sanctification or it could be a damnation. 1 Corinthians 11, you ever read that? You're eating and drinking to your own condemnation. 1 Corinthians 11. Okay. <coughs> Their source is a sanctification or condemnation. Paul says you're eating and drinking to your own condemnation. So, um, there's a good number of you here uh, who are married, probably at least 70%, uh, I think you have to, I'm not trying to cause a guilt, a guilt trip. If this does not apply to you, praise the Lord. But if it does apply to you, these 10 weeks will obviously be the most important 10 weeks in your life. Okay? No brainer. Now it's, it's between you, God, and your conscience. Try in honor of Cardinal Newman. I purposely spoke about Newman because he was a champion of conscience. You, you have to be faithful to your conscience, trying to form your conscience in, in the light of the Word of God, in the light of truth. So... Um, I, I think that, that it, 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 in other words, what we're doing in honor of Newman and Aquinas, Aquinas is we have, to, we, have to be, we have to be open to the truth. Yes? At particular judgment. Yes. Is this mimicking or modeling that type of situation? And the second question I had was, are we doing a general confession from our baptism forward only? Uh, your, your baptism, were you, are, you a, are you a convert? Yes. Okay, good. When, when were you baptized? I was baptized in the Protestant church in 2004, but I converted to Catholicism in 2014. Okay. Okay, you, once you were baptized, you're, were you baptized, was it a valid baptism? It was a valid baptism. 2004, Okay. That moment, even though it was a, a Protestant baptism, that washed away all, all, all the sins of your past. So in my particular judgment, I won't see them. No. Nope. It'll be from that baptism. The last 15 years of your, if you make a general confession, it'll be the last 15 years of your life. That's right. Okay, um, can I expound on that a little bit more? Sometimes, it's a great question, sometimes people that are in your situation feel that what happened maybe earlier, is something that really bothers your conscience. If you want to throw that out, you can. To alleviate your conscience. How, however, theologically, once you're baptized, everything from 2004 before washed away. Hear what I'm saying? Because it, it, could, it could be some, maybe something happened when you're, for example, when you're 15, uh, you're 15, you got so angry that you punched your father. And that has left an indelible mark on your soul. It, okay, it's forgiven with your baptism, but you maybe want to just throw that out to feel a certain psychological relief. Understand? Not that you have to do it, but, you know, if, if I were to have done that, I'd want to just throw it out. Well, for example, a woman commits an abortion... Sometimes you just want that, Father, I've already confessed it. I just want to throw it out because I just, I, I just, I just feel bad about it. And I'll tell the woman, okay, you're forgiven, trust in God's mercy, but for the process of deeper healing, I'm glad you said that. And I admire your humility. Okay? Because wounds, are not, wounds don't heal like that. Sometimes they take a long time to heal wounds. Okay, I would, uh, I'd like to give a, a long talk on, on healing of wounds, but we, we'll, that'll be another talk. But yes, once, uh, yeah, for you it would be the next, you know, the past 15 years of your life. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, good. So, you all following me? Yes. No, this is a. Yeah, all the weeks are important, but this week, it, this week has a special importance because we're arriving at the in a certain sense, kind of like the climax of these exercises, where we, we're in count. Okay, we're okay. Listen, we're in count. All of you are encountering the loving embrace of God the Father. That has to be said. You're encountering the loving embrace of God the Father. You know, God wants to give you his loving embrace, more than you want to receive it. But he respects our freedom. We do not want to throw ourselves in the arms of the loving Father. He's not going to force you to do that. God is not, to, he's not going to coerce or force us to do something against our will. It's one thing that God can never, he, cannot, he can't violate our freedom. He can't violate our freedom. He respects our freedom. Okay, so what I'd like to do now in the, re the rest of the presentation, I want to I want to go through how to make a good general confession. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through the the traditional steps, but maybe go a little bit deep, more detail to the traditional steps. Um, to make a good confession, there are five uh, five concrete steps that you have to carry out to make a good confession. Again, the the first is this: okay, examination of conscience. We're going to be giving you this little booklet, and ask like this is about the best thing out there. Um, I'd like to ask for your prayers because I wrote about <coughs> six years ago. I wrote another booklet, which I think is much better than this, but it doesn't have the imprimatur yet. And um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell you, I've been tempted. I've been tempted to give it out, but my my provincial and my superior have prohibited me to do it here in L.A. So I have to vow obedience. <laughs> but once it's published, I think it's going to sell like hotcakes. In Spanish name, I think it'll 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 hit here all the all the way to Argentina, and it'll set on fire, because wow. it's really I mean this is really good, but I'm not tooting my horn. Mine is much better, <laughs> <laughs> okay, because this one was written about 25 years ago. Mine was written about seven years ago, taking into account the modern electronic media. So mine is more modern, okay. Uh, and the, the introduction, I give a summary of John Paul II's reconciliation and penance. I give a little catechesis on confession. And anyway, I take every commandment, and every commandment I go through in great deal mortal sin and venial sin. But um, I don't have the stamp of approval yet. But um, Sophia Press said they would publish it just off the drop of the hat. But no, I have to. I have to obey my superiors, no? But this is this is good. Maybe 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 because of your fervent prayers that the uh, the key will be unlocked and they'll publish my examination conscience and do a lot of good. I think to millions, no, but it's still it's still in it's still in the barn, okay? On the back burner. Um, and I think one of the reasons why is uh, if you're a priest for 33 years and you're hearing two, three, seven, eight hours of confession every day for 33 years, you have a little bit of experience. Who knows? Maybe it's a million confessions already. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm an oblate, die in the pulp of the confessional. So I, I really believe, um, because look, uh, you people can't say Mass. You people, you can preach, you can visit the sex, you can teach catechism, you can give spiritual direction, but none of you, all of you can, all of you can say this: "I absolve your sins in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit," but nothing's going to happen. <coughs> when I say it, what's going to happen? <laughs> You're forgiven. So I know that this is a, this is a huge gift to the church. And whether or not I, I, I I'm Horace. I've got a splitting headache, you know, I don't say anything except as long as you're here, I absolve your sins. 
I mean, you're, you're forgiven. So um, I, I, I wrote that having, having, you know, three decades of experience as a priest. So I'm not writing as a novice, but rather as a, a salty, tested, <laughs> um, experienced confessor. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, not saying I'm, I'm the best in the world, but I have, a, I have a lot of experience. And, and moral theology as a priest, we have to have a good, a good grip on moral theology. There's a lot of weird things happening. Uh, but I'm very orthodox, and I, if I'm not, correct me, okay? Amen? Amen. Okay, so the first, to examine your conscience. You're going to have this booklet. And just go through it a commandment at, at a time. Uh, read the intro. Then all of you you, you who are making the, exa- the, the general confession... We want you to write down the sins. If you don't write down the sins, what's going to happen? Did you ever have a senior moment? <laughs> have you? Yes, sir. Okay, we all have senior moments, right? We all have, you know, memory lapses, no? Well, GA 29, right? It happens, no? Heard a lady that uh, bought her husband memory pills, but he always forgot to take them. (laughs) (laughs) Thought you'd like that one, huh? (laughs) So, write it out. Otherwise, what's going to happen, you know, you confess and you forget to confess the most important thing. Yeah. And you'll leave and when you go back and there's ten people waiting, they say, hey, pal, hit the line. Huh? <laughs> this is my father said. <laughs> okay, so the second step is this. So the first examination of conscience, the second is, is uh, sorrow for your sin. So, st- step two and three are really the most important. Well, they're all connected, but if you don't have sorrow for your sin, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? No? And you have to have sorrow for your sin. And I would say, this is a, this is a, your preparation usually takes, I'd say, four to six hours? About that, Derek? I say it usually takes uh, about five hours. Most people, it takes five hours to prepare. So that being said, I think you should give yourself a a good block of time where you're you're not going to be interrupted. Here's a question: Are you a morning bird or a night owl? Man, I'm a morning bird. You give me a good cup of coffee, good holy hour, I'm dynamite hmm? in the morning. I mean, I can pump out a lot. Yeah, hit, hit the afternoon, the evening. My intellectual acumen starts to dim and very quickly. <laughs> but in the morning, I'm dynamite. I, I, can, I, I can do a lot uh, in the morning. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm a morning person. Get a good night's rest. Get up early, make my holy hour, always with a good cup of coffee. <laughs> so give yourself, I say, give yourself either the morning or maybe, it depends. Maybe you're an afternoon person. Maybe you're, maybe you're a night owl. I say, give yourself, give yourself five hours, all morning. No phone calls. Uh, put the pet parakeet Pete in the, in the attic so you're not going to be hearing these you want to have silence. And then you have to you have to you have to be you have to beg for the grace, beg for the grace to have sorrow. As prayer is a grace, so to arrive at real sorrow for your sin, you gotta beg for the grace. 
What might elicit the grace is you're there before Jesus crucified or divine mercy image or Our Lady Guadalupe. These are all, no, do you know what elicit means? It means to draw forth, okay? These can provoke or elicit uh, sorrow by looking at Jesus on the cross, like Marcelina Panavino, right? Marcelina Panavino. We're looking at divine mercy that moves us to want to love Christ all the more. We'll look at Our Lady of Mercy. But what, what can I say? You know, we look at Mary, and Mary, Mary grants us the grace of conversion. Fulton Sheen said that Fulton, Fulton Sheen said that Judas did not repent because he didn't look in the eyes of Mary. I like that. If he were to have looked in the eyes of Mary, Mary would obtain for Judas Iscariot repentance. That's written in the, fir the world's first love, one of the writings of Fulton Sheen on the Blessed Mother. Okay, sorrow. There are two types of sorrow. There's what is called uh, imperfect sorrow or imperfect contrition or per imperfect. What is the difference between the two? Okay, imperfect is this. Do you all know the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? You forgot, huh? Okay, the first gift in operation, according to your friend Aquinas, and I think that he's your friend, is fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Thomas Aquinas says that's the first one in operation. The greatest is wisdom, okay? which perfects charity if you're a Thomist. Okay? So, if you're sorry when you go to confession because of fear of the Lord, you're, you have this fear of losing your soul, okay, that's good enough. That's good enough for your confession to be valid. But I think you want to go beyond that. I think you want to go beyond that. Perfect contrition is this. I don't want to sin because I know God loves me so much and I want to love him in return. That's perfect contrition. Beg for, beg for the grace of both of those. Here's kind of a homey example for you. Did you have to make the beds of your children until they graduated from high school? Yes? I think I started when I was six years old, no? I think it's a, it's a sign of good parenting and teaching your kids to make their own beds. I think it's a weak mother that always has to do everything for their kids, no? Never going to grow up, huh? So maybe it happened in your case, you... As the mother said, Johnny, make your bed. I'm not going to make it. Make your bed. I'm not going to make it. Make your bed. I'm not going to make it. Come home and you tell your husband, Johnny did not make his bed. Okay, let's go to your room. And you spank the little boy. Following day, mom says, Johnny, make your bed. Yes, Mom. <laughs> That's fear of punishment. You want to arrive at a point where you're making your bed because you're not free, fear. You, there's no fear of being thrashed by your father when he comes home from work. But, you know, if it's just fear of the Lord, that's, that's good enough to be absolved. But I think we should go beyond that. I think we should have fear of the Lord, but I think we should really love God. Amen? Amen. Amen. All of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Okay, the third is, it's called firm purpose of amendment. Firm purpose of amendment means I make the decision to avoid any person, place, thing, or circumstance that leads me into sin. 
In other words, you don't want to be playing with fire. You play with fire, you're going to get burnt. He who walks on thin ice is going to cave in. He who walks on a slippery slope is going to slip and fall. <laughs> so you have to step back and look at what are the near occasions of sin for you. And you have to avoid that. This is probably the step that we're weakest in and when we make our confessions. It's the practical step. You have to rewind the film of your life and see what led me to, 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 to capitulate and fall into this sin. See, you might have this guy that he's got trouble with drinking. When he's by himself, no problem. But when he's with his his beer buddies, his beer guzzlers, huh? There's the temptation to drink because of the peer pressure of his beer buddies. So he makes the promise, I'm not going to drink. And he goes through six months, but it's, he's arriving at Thanksgiving weekend. So he's driving down and he hears a voice that says, why don't you just greet your friends? It's Friday after Thanksgiving. Just greet your beer belly, your, your beer, your beer, your beer bellies. <laughs> beer belly buddies, okay? That's a Freudian slip, huh? Okay. So he drives by, and there they are in the corner. It's Friday after Thanksgiving. It's about 7 o'clock at night. And one of the guys sees the guy, sees him. His name is Juanito. Hey, and he says, hey, Juanito. Juanito. Ven aquí, échate una no más. Échate una no más. No más, no más. Échate una, no? Which is Spanish for, you know, just one. Just one. Échate una no más. Vámonos, pues, come on. Yeah. And they say, no, 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 no. I'm not, not going to drink. No, no, I know it's, I, if I, no, I'm going to drink. And then one of them, the typical macho, says, ah, mandilon. <laughs> what that means? Mama's boy. Mama's boy. And he goes and he doesn't drink one. He drinks a whole six pack and starts to sing Christmas songs in the middle of November, huh? <laughs> He did not avoid the near occasion of sin. That was a near occasion of sin. So rewind the film of your life. And maybe this is a circumstance. Once a week, even after Mass, I go up to have coffee with my friends. And it's a group of cheese, cheese mozas. <laughs> that means well, people that eat cheese, right? Chuck your cheese. Right? <laughs> and you know, every time you go there, you're going to start off by talking about the homily and the Mass of St. Peter Chanel, the 8 o'clock Mass. No? <laughs> but then you drift into talking about people. My father said, noble people talk about ideas, ignoble people talk about people. My dad would say, amen? Yeah. Good advice, huh? Noble people talk about ideas, ignoble people talk about people. <laughs> so you might have to avoid that. So look, you have, you have to try to find what is your kryptonite, what is your weak point? What is your kryptonite? What is your weak point? One of the strongest temptations is that of pornography. You know, you know you're alone, no one's there, you're in desolation, the devil's there, fall into that. Okay, well, step back and next time you find yourself in a state of desolation, you're alone, instead of going there, you have to go in another direction. Got that? So the, the third step is, is probably where we're weakest. And if you're not strong on the third, you're going to 
you're going to repeat, you're going to always be, be repeating the same thing in confession. You're never going to change. You know, disco rayado, you know, the broken, the broken record confession. So really feel, if you really want to progress in confession, you've got to hone in on number three. You know, it, it's, it's hard and it's kind of painful, but you have to hone in and I fell, but what led up to that fall? There's step one, two, three, four, you fall. So once you see yourself slipping down that slippery slope, instead of allowing yourself to slip down, go in the other direction, the Aja de Contra. And you're, you're, going, you're going to advance. <coughs> My friends, the two most important things we can do in our lives is to receive communion and receive confession. Those are the two most important things. That's why I'm really expounding upon this, because our salvation depends on Jesus. Jesus is present in the church. Jesus comes to us through the sacraments. We receive the sacraments well, my friends, we're on the highway to heaven. But if we're, if we're uh, flippant, nonchalant, and lackadaisical about our reception of the sacraments, I mean, we're, we're jeopardizing our sanctification. Try to go to confession as if it were your first, your last, and your only. Try to go to communion as if it's your first, your last, and your only. Don't take the Lord for granted. Yep. What, ru what ruins marriages? Taking your spouse for granted. Anyone in marriage encounter or, or crochet will tell you that, right? And, and, no, anyone. And, and, and taking your spouse for granted is about the worst thing. Well, she's always there. We can sometimes take the Lord for granted. Huh? You look at St. Peter Chanel, so many masses, confession, eh. They come, come late to one mass, they come early to the following mass. <laughs> and it's true, huh? If we had like Juan Diego, we had to walk 25 miles to the mass, I think we'd appreciate it all the more, wouldn't we? Hello? Okay, the fourth step is this. Up to this point, you, even haven't, you haven't reached the confessional yet. Okay? Fourth step is you go to confession. One St. Faustina went to confession. She came out in tranquil. Jesus appeared to her. She said, why am I not at peace? And he said, because you did not pray for the priest before you went to confession. Probably none of you have ever done that before. Right? Well, is it good to pray for the priest? Do it! <laughs> it works. Do you know that I have a guardian angel? Aquinas says the priest has two. Once we're ordained, he gives us another, priest, another guardian angel. It's a, it's a theological opinion, but I kind of like it, don't you? <laughs> we got, we've got more than ten devils, no? But we have to have at least two guardian angels, huh? So pray for the priest before. And then uh, when you go into the confessional, okay, make sure that you close the door, okay? Do you know what an eave, eavesdropper is? Is that a New York expression? I don't think they say that in California. Eavesdropper. Eavesdropper? Because yeah. if you leave the door open, they, they might hear your sins. Do you want your sins publicized? Of course not. So close the door. Then when you leave, leave the door open. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the people that, clo that leave the door open, then they close it when they leave. No? <laughs> G.K. Chester, apostle of common sense, come to our aid. Huh? Okay, then when you enter in, you can either go behind the screen or go face to face. That's up to you. It's a good idea to start with the basics. Now, if you're, if you're my age, we were taught how to confess. I think that, that we, were really, we were taught well. If you were, you were born in the mid-50s or the 40s, right? You were taught, you come in and you start 
And you should start, not the priest, here in L.A. Why? Because I don't know, I don't know what language to speak. Because if you don't start, I start to speak in English. Padre, no habla inglés. Then right away, right away we, we started off bad. I'm already a little bit angry inside. I'm already perturbed, okay? Be assertive. Take, be assertive. Somewhat aggressive. Go for it, no? You know, don't, don't, don't come in wishy-washy, know, exa know exactly what you're going to do. Come in, close the door, kneel down, make the sign of the cross, and say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was a month ago. This is a general confession. These are my sins. Wow! I'm going to give you a small penance just for that, okay? <laughs> You know, that, that, that was all done in 30 seconds. But if you, see, if you do that, right away I feel I, I just, I'm in consolation. That gives me consolation. But if you just come in and you, and you stare at me, <laughs> I'm in desolation. <laughs> You're staring at me. <laughs> now, I, I really love assertive people. Maybe it's my temperament. Well, you people, they know what they're doing, no? And I think most of you, you're old enough to know, to know what you're doing, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, sign of the cross. Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. My last confession was a month ago. Okay, this is a general confession. These are my sins. Yeah. That's great. Why do I say it's important to mention the time? Because I am a spiritual doctor. I'm a spiritual surgeon. My parents hit the jackpot because they've got a physical surgeon, they've got a spiritual surgeon in the family, number one and two. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Faustina gives us the three qualities of a good confession. You want to know them? Yes. Then I'll tell you. Transparency, humility, and obedience. Yep. Those are the three qualities, according to St. Faustina Kowalska, of a good confession. Transparency, okay, humility, and obedience. Transparency means try to be clear. Not murky. The Spanish turbia. No? Try to be clear. Do you remember that program uh, with Joe Friday Dragnet back in the 60s? Remember that? Remember that Joe Friday? He would say, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts, ma'am. And I said, just the sins, ma'am. Just the sins, ma'am. Just the sins, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, remember Dragnet, okay? So uh, don't beat around the bush. <clears throat> then humility, you gotta be humble. <coughs> Father, my husband is proud, he's angry, he drinks, he tells lies, he doesn't pray, well, whose confession is this? <laughs> if your husband's coming in, I'll have to say he doesn't have to go to confession. You already confessed for him, huh? <laughs> Don't confess the sins of your husband. You know, there's, there's a lot of pride in that, no? It might be involved, but you know, sometimes there's a lot of pride. We don't want to admit, we don't want to admit our own sin. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's got to be humble. Humility is the truth, <laughs> Teresa of Avila. Humility is the truth. Then it's got to be obedient. 
Okay, for your penance, I want you to say eight Hail Marys. How about four? Come on, just obey the priest. You know, be arm, arm wrestling me during the... I used to be a good arm wrestler. No, no. Eight, no, four, okay. Two, two rosaries, okay? <laughs> obey. You have to learn how to obey. Okay, another element, this is essential to make a good confession, is this. And this is canon law in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. When you confess your sins, you have to tell the number of mortal sins. Number and species. This is the code of canon law, which means the official law of the Catholic Church. Since Vatican II, very few people, very few people do this. Therefore, myself as a confessor, pretty well trained, I think, uh, I, it's almost like a knee-jerk reaction. I say, how many times? It's almost like a knee-jerk reaction, okay? <laughs> but uh, the fact that I do that, that means that you don't really confess well. Your confessions are not complete. They're sloppy. Remember the sloppy Joes he used to eat in the 60s, no? Yeah. Uh, sloppy confessions. In other words, I do my part, you do yours. Okay? 50-50, you do your part. I'll do mine as a priest, you do your work. I shouldn't have to do all the work for you. And 90% of your confession is your preparation before you come to the confessional. I say 95%. 95% of your confession depends on what you did before you entered the confessional. So if you're really well prepared, uh, re really well prepared, um, it shouldn't take too long. And I forgot to say it, but we're going to be giving you, we're going to try to give you 10 minutes, okay, because we got a lot of people. So prepare yourself four or five hours, but we'll give you ten minutes. Okay, this is not a gap session. This is not psycho, uh, psychoanalysis. Um, you know, you say, I'm not going to be talking about the Yankees against the Astros. Well, no, that's, that's another talk, okay? Yeah. Yes? Uh, how do you number that in a general confession? Because I have so many mortal sins, I can't count them. <laughs> Okay, uh, I, this is usually what I say in response to that. Maybe you're not good in math. Are you pretty good in math? I'm uh, math teacher. Oh, math <laughs> 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 That's never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you this. <laughs> if I were your student, I would be in detention for about two years. <laughs> that was always my, always my worst subject. <laughs> you probably put a cone in my head. <laughs> put the dunce and put me in the corner. <laughs> Was perfect, no. <laughs> the math major. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, let me ask you then: Is uh, is the Holy Spirit a better math teacher than you? Absolutely. So you you would be surprised if you pray the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can help you to get pretty darn close to what it is. So you have to you try to try to be calculated as best you can. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, because it's hard if you're confessing after 50 years. But say, for example, okay, you know you um, say you miss you miss mass uh, for 20 years. How many week? How many how, ma how many weeks in a year? Okay, so 52 uh, times. Okay. So you can do, 
You, you could just say, I miss Mass every Sunday for five years, but if you want to, you want to multiply it, there you have it. No? Or b before getting married, I had premarital sex. How many times? It was just aye, once? Aye, aye. No. It was once, uh, once a week for three years. No? So you got probably about, you know, something like uh, 170, something like that. No? I think if you, if, you really, if you really pray to the Holy Spirit, you can come pretty darn close with the help of the Holy Spirit. Hmm? Okay. So if any of you have problems with math and doing your confession, we'll send you to him, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but seek of the confessional. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Because I remember going to a priest and he said, Oh, that's from your past Virginia. You don't have to say it. So no, that, then I went no. to another priest and then, because I didn't want to get yelled again, I said, This might be a venial sin. But then he yelled at me because he says, How do you know it's a venial sin? You just tell me the sin and I'll tell you if it's venial mortal. Okay. So. That's why you have to pray for a priest and, and you have to. Uh, you have to maybe choose your confessor. If someone comes to me and really feels that it's a mortal sin because the conscience is weighed down, I respect the person. Then I will intervene as a teacher and I'll say, okay, objectively what you said would not be a mortal sin, but you, if you felt that it was, um, okay, f for example, do you... Um, do you, go, do you go to Mass on Good Friday? Okay, you two? Those two Vietnamese women, they go to Mass on Good Friday. Okay, there's no Mass on Good Friday, okay? Okay? You hear me? Because they thought that they had to go to Mass on Good Friday. Now, you felt that you had to go to Mass on Good Friday. You purposely did not go. You felt that that was a moral obligation. That would be a mortal sin. You have you, you you would not have a well formed conscience, but the fact that you went against your conscience, you thought that that was a serious sin, that's a mortal sin. Now I intervene as a teacher, as a, mor a moral formator of the conscience, and I say, look, Good Friday, you have a beautiful ceremony. It's the liturgy of the Passion of Christ. You don't have to come, but if you can come, please come. But also. If you're younger than 59, you got to fast. And if you don't do that, that could be a mortal sin. See how, uh, see, see, this is, this is, uh, this is so as, as, as confessor, I pull back, I allow the person to unload the conscience because the person real, really feels that it was serious. Then I intervene, trying in a gentle way, saying, look, you know, there's no Mass on Good Friday, but come anyway to the ceremony. So as, as, as confessor, we're brother, we're father, we're priest, we're psychologist, we're judge. I mean, we're, we, we have about ten different roles as a confessor. We're a listener. So it's, it's an art to be a good confessor. It's hard work. It takes a lot of training and a lot of, a lot of patience and a lot of grace. A lot of love. And a lot of love, no? Yes, a lot of love, that's true. And, and recognizing that after you make a good confession, I'm aware of this, person will come in loaded down with guilt and fear and shame, and once you get it out, how do you feel? How do you feel? There, there's probably no better feeling in the world than, than you making a good confession. And I feel humble I feel humbled in the fact that God is using me as an altar Christos to be the conduit or the channel by which I'm reconciling you to God. I'm the bridge. So it's very humbling as a priest. And uh, very humbling as a priest. But uh, it's, it, you know, our salvation depends a lot upon confession. Yeah, our confession... Uh, if you have the habit of frequent confession all your life, uh, I think it's almost impossible for you not to be saved. If you pursue this, 
periodically, you prepare yourself. You're, because frequent confession is a constant call to conversion. It's a sacrament of conversion. So once you make this general confession, I think the rest of your confessions, rest of your life, they're going to be a little bit easier. Because you've prepared yourself so well, you've cleaned the barn, and I think a lot of fears we have, they're going to dissipate. So I think one of the glories of this program is the general confession. Uh, is being able to make a general confession. You're going to have a team of priests. You're going to have all the ob you know, you're have oblate priests there. We're going to be giving you how many hours all together, Mary? Uh, hours. We're going to be giving you 30 hours of priest time to hear confessions. No, that's a lot. No, and uh, we're priests, we're not unemployed. We're busy. No, but we give this. We give priority to this. We've had, for example, la last year. La last year during the Lent, uh, we had a thousand. How many? All the programs together. All the programs through the well, through the program. Last I think we had about a thousand two. No, we we had we had about twelve hundred people through the program in one year. Yeah, we, yeah. But 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 the Lenten <coughs> season wasn't it like twelve hundred. The season season itself was um, was a thousand. So we had a thousand people last Lent doing the exercise. We were in Yorba Linda. We were here. The, uh, this group is about 220 that are making it. Probably about 100 will make their general confession because some of them have made it, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it was 1,200. No, that was the whole year. In Lent itself, it was 800. It was 800 in Lent. We did about 1,200 yeah. in the whole year. Yeah. I think with the Spanish, we had another 500. So well, we did. We yeah. did. That's right. So it was about 1,200. 1,200 in one, in one, one yeah. session. That, that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. okay. 1,200 souls. It's a good harvest, isn't it? No? Yes. <laughs> okay, so there we have that. Then, uh, uh, so confess to the priest, uh, humility, transparency, and obedience. And then, at the end of your confession, Father, I'm sorry for all these sins. And the sins I'm not aware of, I beg for you, I beg of you, pardon and absolution and penance. And you say the act of contrition. Do you know the act of contrition? Mm -hmm. If you don't know the act of contrition, then uh, you can read it. If you want to say it Vietnamese or Chinese or you want to say it in Spanish, fine. We can, God understands Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. I don't, but God does, okay? God understands Spanish too. Then the priest gives you absolution. He says, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful words, huh? In that moment, your sins are forgiven. All of the sins you've confessed are forgiven. From each of you. And you can start a new life. Okay, um, then the fifth step is you've got to carry out the penance. Okay, right now I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to say something that you're really going to like. And this is uh, carry out the penance with the, which, which the priest gives you. But I'm gonna, I want all of you who make this confession to receive a plenary indulgence. Okay. You know what that means? Yes. Plenary indulgence means you go to confession, okay, and you carry out the penance, but go a little bit beyond that. Plenary indulgence would be this. Praying the rosary, even though the priest might not give that as a penance, may, maybe do it anyway. Pray the rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Or you can pray it in your family, either in front of the Blessed Sacrament or with your family. Second is, you pray for the Pope and his intentions. Third is, third is, you make the firm proposal to reject sin. 
In other words, you're making that firm proposal to give up sin. To have no affection, even to venial sin. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're going to fall, but you have a firm purpose? I don't want to sin. I want to give up sin. <coughs> so when you're confessing, that's your per, firm purpose of meant right there. I want to give up all sin. Okay, then, okay, you go to Mass and receive Holy Communion. If you carry that out, your confession, your rosary, and praying for the Pope, and getting giving up sin, and you receive communion, a plenary indulgence means this. All of your sins are not only pardoned, but the temporal punishment due to the sins is washed clean. So that if you die, you go right to heaven. Your soul becomes white as the snow, it's as if you're being baptized. The difference between that and the, the divine mercy promise, I don't know the difference. I think it's the same. I've talked to Father Larry about this and experts. They don't seem to have really any difference. Sometimes we think we can receive the divine mercy promise once a year. That's true. But you can receive a plenary indulgence every day if you want. So that means, that means if you want to go to heaven when you die, all of you can if you want. Do you? Yes. Or do you want to go to purgatory first? Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Do you feel happy about that? Yes. That give you consolation? Yes. So, no, so irrespective of what you've done, so as long as you're sorry, you're sorry for your sins, you're not, you're not, you're not playing with fire. You, you have to make the firm purpose of amendment. You avoid the near occasion of sin, you've got to go through those five steps. If you're going there, well, you know, I, you know, I gossip, but you know, I'm not going to give up the gossip, then you're not going to get it. You've got to be firm in that. You have to avoid the near occasion of sin. So there's a good chance that all of you, all of you here in this, all of you here in this meeting, when you die, you can go right to heaven if you people want to. I'm planning to go to heaven right away. Pray for me. I'm a sinner like all of you people. I go to confession usually every 10 days, not every, every week. Two weeks is too much. Maybe every, I like to go to conf confession every week. I like to be at peace. I like to be at peace. You go to confession frequently, you always have peace and joy if you, if you, if you pursue this confession frequently. This is it's huge if you understand. What I've taught you now is huge for your eternal salvation and for you arriving at heaven as soon as possible. And it really depends on one word. Can I tell you? Loving God with your whole being. Because by saying no to sin, you're really saying, I don't want sin because God, I love you. And I don't want to do, I don't want to do anything to hurt you. You are my greatest lover. And I'm even willing to die rather than to hurt you. Got that? Any it's after any confession, but given that this is going to be the best confession in your life, uh, go for it. Now, listen, uh, the priest that you go to, he may, not, he may say, well, your, your penance, I want you to say three Hail Marys, and that's it. So I'm saying go beyond that. Go beyond that. So is, when you leave the confessional, we're probably going to have the Blessed Sacrament exposed in the... In the old church, we'll have the Blessed Sacrament exposed Friday morning yes. and Saturday. Yes. We'll probably have the Blessed Sacrament exposed. Um, so there you have the Blessed Sacrament for you. If not the new church, we might have a wedding or something. But I would say take advantage. Mm -hmm. Stay there. Come out of the confessional. Stay there. Pray your rosary. You know, give yourself. After, after confession, spend a half hour just you know, enjoying the interior peace that God gives to you. Bask in God's glory. Make it such a such an event where you really you're not rushing at all. You're, you know, sorry that we have to give you ten minutes. You no, know, but you know you're preparing yourself well. You confess it well. You come out with peace. We have a lot of people praying for you. People are going to be greeting you. Uh, try to make it the greatest experience in your life. And I really believe if this is done, this could change your whole life. Which God is going to be using you to become great saints and using you to save a lot of souls. 
because blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. If we have purity of heart, purity of mind, purity of intention, then God can use you to save hundreds, maybe thousands of souls. Yes? Father, um, is, the plenary, is it true if the plenary indulgence is invalid if you're not in a state of grace? Yes. Well, what, 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 everything we're saying is through confession, you're in the state of grace. You see? Yeah, if you're not in the state of grace, it's not going to work. Yeah, this... You, you see, the plenary indulgence is very Catholic because it depends on two sacraments. The way you receive confession, then, then you go and you receive communion and try to make the most fervent communion in your life. This should really give you a lot of peace because, hey... Even though you commit millions of sins, you make the confession, they're all forgiven. And God has forgotten these sins. God, God has amnesia. God has forgotten those sins. <laughs> Do you want to bring them back? Fine, but God, God has washed them clean. Isn't it great to be Catholic? Yes. Now, the fact that God offers these gifts, and so, so few people understand this. That's why I'm dedicating my whole life to teaching. I'm going to be teaching and preaching till I die because... You have a right to the truth, right? You have a right to the truth. And how many parents here? Tell your children about this. Tell your wife about this. They don't know about it. Tell your children about this. Isn't that love? You know, don't you want the best for it? What is, how does Aquinas define love? Love is, is willing the good of the other. What is the greatest good? The salvation of one's soul. The salvation of our soul is, is what? That's principle and foundation. I told you I'd be reminding you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Can you get a plenary for someone else? Okay, for the souls in purgatory, yes. But for another person, you can't always because that person could be resisting God's grace. Like, for example, I could pray, I could pray for your son that he come to church, and God, God sends him a lot of lights in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of push, and he says no. But the soul is in purgatory, yes. But you, you might apply it to your uncle, and God might say, okay, this is for your uncle, but I want to apply it to your aunt who lived 400 years ago. I mean, God is more intelligent than we are. Okay? He knows time and math even better than you. Okay? Okay. <laughs> 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 You're not going to fight that one, are you? <laughs> How often can we receive general confession? Okay, general confession, these are great questions. Um, in, in the program now, only those who are here making their first time will make the general confession right now because of the numbers we have. No? So those who are, we have, this session we have about six, probably about 50% of new people. And uh, not, not to say the others are old, no? But uh, you've already done the exercises. So we want to give the newcomers. And then later on, um, you, know, you, you know what I try to do? Not that you have to imitate me. I try to make a general confession every year for the whole year. So I hit right around Christmas. I'll kind of reevaluate what happened the whole year. And I'll... Uh, prepare myself well, I'll go off to Dominguez Hill, I'll go off where I got my confessor, and I'll, Father, can you maybe give me an extra five minutes today? Yeah. yeah. I just want to make a general confession of the whole year, and I'll just go through the year, and I'll renew sorrow for my sins during the past year. Because we have these vestiges within us, these bad tendencies. No? Even though they're forgiven, say for example, you've always been angry and impatient, you confess, it doesn't mean that right away you're going to be the most patient person in the world. You still have these bad tendencies that have to be expunged and erased in time. For me, I, I, for me, confession is so important. When I went on popular mission to Houston, pray that they lose today, and as well as... Uh, <laughs> I won't tell you who they're, who they're playing, no? But uh, they lost yesterday 7-0. A three-hitter, Tanaka. I won't tell you what team I like, though. Okay. 
Uh, I really try to promote the general confession. When I was in Vero Beach in Houston, my whole mission was preparing these people to make a general confession. And they ate it up. They, they ate it up because they'd never heard anything like this before. You know, once this is presented to people, good Catholics, they love it. They love it. And once they make the general confession, they'll come back to us every session saying, Father, that confession changed my life. Right, Mary? Absolutely. Right, Eric? Hmm? I mean, it changes lives. And in the, 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 the peace of soul, we all want peace, right? Yes. Nothing better in the world than to make a general confession if you want to experience interior peace. And once you have that, really, the, the things that happen in the world, it doesn't really matter that much. You've got God. Yes. You've got God, you've got everything. Okay, you've got problems with politics, you've got problems in... Syria, you got problems in Ireland, you got problems with uh, so many problems. But if you are right with God, that's really the only thing that matters. Amen? Amen. So tonight uh, at my 7 o'clock Mass, I'll be praying for you, and I'm going to start a novena as a secondary intention starting tonight. I'm going to be praying for all of you for nine days, which means a secondary intention, all of my Masses, that this will be the best experience in your life. Amen. Amen? Amen? Let's ask Mary to help us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou woman, and blessed the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. God bless.